Hello everyone. My name is Dina Atta. I'm working as a petroleum engineer at Khalda Petroleum Company. I'll be your moderator today. I want to welcome all of you for our session and I want to welcome uh, Mr. Kurt, Mark Kurt Mir. He will be our presenter today. Let me introduce him to you. Mr. Kurt Mir uh, is a petroleum engineer uh, and he is a 1982 petroleum engineering graduate of the University of Louisiana. He started his career as a production and reservoir engineer working fields in South Louisiana and the Gulf of Mexico. Kurt uh, now has extensive reserve and evaluation experience in most U.S. producing areas and several foreign countries. In 2005, he started uh, Mir and Associate uh, Company, uh, a reserve and evaluation consultant, consulting firm with over uh, 40, 40, 40 clients ranging from small operators, investors, and larger companies such as PP America, Mitsu, ENP, and El Paso International. Uh, uh, Mr. Mir, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, welcome everybody. My name's Kurt Meir, and uh, I'd like to run through some basic aspects of uh, reserves evaluation. So let's go right into it. So you, all right, some of the topics we're gonna cover are, are basic principles, uh, reserve classification, you know, why do we need reserve estimates? We'll talk about that. And then what methods can you use to estimate reserves? And we're going to look at the different methods, uh, value metrics, analogy, type curves are the new thing, material balance a little bit, and simulation a little bit. And then we're also going to talk about how you value reserves. We can do it as a market analysis, but the most popular way is discounted cash flow analysis. So we're going to talk about those items. So let's go ahead and get right in. All right, so I just want to give you some basic principles that will help you in your career because sometimes the terminology that you hear is different, but um, when we do a reserve evaluation, there's two things we want to do. We want to estimate the volumes, you know, the oil, the gas, but we also have to estimate the value of the reserves. It's not just counting the barrels. So it's two parts. So that, I wanted to get that straight to you. And um, some things to remember, reserves are always remaining. If they're not remaining, they're not reserved. So just some people, you know, like remaining recoverable reserves, that's, uh, that's not the correct terminology. All reserves are remaining. So if they're not remaining, they're not reserves. And all reserves are economic. So if, if you have a million barrels of oil in the reservoir, but only half a million can be ex produced economically, the reserves are half a million barrels, not a million. So always keep that in mind. And reserves always has an as of date. If you can, the reserves change every day when you have a producing well. So you always have to know what's your assignment. Do you want the reserves as of the first of the year? Do you want the reserves as of today? So you always have to keep that in mind. And I'll give you a little tip in your career. I'll, every time you're doing reserve calculations and taking notes, always date your work because I'll come back and look at your report 10 years from now and you'll be talking about how, how many, much oil reserves were left, but you don't tell me what year you did the work so I can't figure it out. So always date your work when you're doing reserve uh, calculations and evaluations. So that's just some basic stuff. All right, so why are reserves important? Well, it helps value the oil company because barrels of reserves, you know, equals dollars. They can be, it can have a value, but also because we're gonna project the value and cash flow of the reserves over time, when we do a reserves evaluation, we can, we can tell the company how much revenue they're gonna be having in, uh, you know, in the future. So it helps them with their planning and all. So that's part of reserves. It also determines the health of the company, of the oil company, because if, you do, if you check the reserves every year, if they're going down, that means the company's going out of business. So you can look at the reserves from last year compared to this year and see if the company is healthy, are they growing? And uh, one, one thing you can look at is the R over P ratio, which is just the reserves divided by the annual production. 
so that the units would be years. So it, if you have an R of a P of 10 years, that means the, at the rate you're producing right now, you're gonna run out of reserves in 10 years. So that, that's something you can get from your reserve report. But it's also uh, real important to calculate earnings of the oil company because earnings is equal to the revenue minus the expenses minus the DDNA rate, which is depletion, depreciation, and amortization. And I'm not going to get into the economics and financial stuff, but the DDNA rate is based on uh, as you recover the reserves, you write off an expense at a dollar per barrel. So you have to know how many barrels you have to do that calculation. So it's real important for the financial people when they're looking at a, a company or reserve field, you have to, you can get the, uh, helps calculate the earnings. So those are important things. The, but sometimes the government requires you to uh, issue reserve reports. In the United States, if you're a public company, you have to report reserves every year. So your investors know, you know, what's going on. So those are some of the reasons the reserves are important, but there's many other reasons. All right, so I'm gonna just go briefly into some of the classification systems that we use, the common ones, okay? And the main one is the SEC, which is the US Securities and Exchange Commission. And that's, that's set up for public companies so they can report to the public you know, their reserves. So it gives you guidelines and directions on how you do reserves to be in compliance with the SEC regulations. Now, one that's a little bit newer is the Petroleum Resources Management System called PRMS, and it's, it was developed by several of the professional societies. Uh, and so it's a completely different way of doing things, and it, it's more popular with non-US companies. But those are general comments. All right, so the SEC, we basically come up with a best estimate of the reserves. We call that a deterministic method. And we can have proved reserves, probable and possible. But the SEC is a little different because it tells you what oil and gas prices you have to use in your reserve projection. So it specifies that. All right, here's some information on the PRMS system. It's more of a, uh, it's more of a uh, chart with ranges and uh, let's look at it right here. So basically you can have reserves, you can have contingent resources, which would be reserve uh, volumes of oil and gas that are not economic at this time, or you're not sure you're gonna develop them. And you could have prospective reserves which mean that might be just a drilling prospect that you, you haven't discovered the oil or gas yet. But anyway, you have uh, these, the way you categorize it is in this little matrix, which the range of uncertainty of how much oil and gas you have is at the bottom and then uh, the increasing chance of commerciality. So that's kind of, that's just in a nutshell how the PRMS works. So it's, it's completely different than uh, the SEC way to do it. And it's different. One of the main differences is that we don't calculate a, a one value of the reserves. We give a range of reserves and we use probability. So like here's an example of the reserve distribution for one well. And so we can ask, we, we don't know how much reserves the well have, but we can get a range and there's ways of doing this uh, when you have uncertainty in some of the parameters. But anyway, so we can have reserves and the P90 uh, numbers would be considered proved. So the P90 in this case is 389 um, MMCF of gas, uh, 382. So what that means is that for this well, our analysis shows that there's a 90% chance that the reserves will be higher than 382 uh, mm million cubic feet of gas. And then the probable is assigned the P50 uh, value, which is shown here. And then the possible reserves would be the high side or the P10. 
So that so it's it's you have to do a range of reserves for the PRMS PRMS system. All right, so let's talk about reserve classes. How do you classify reserves? Well, like I said, we could have proved. But when you talk about proved in the U.S. system, uh, it, there could be two items. You know, are we sure there's oil there? Do we have a high confidence that it's proved? We know there's oil in that reservoir. But it also could mean, but we know there's oil there, but we know it, at least it's as we know it's at least as big as this, you know, the low case of P90. So there's two, two parts to prove. And so you kind of got to understand that. And on probable, it's the same thing. We prob there's probably some oil over there, and it's probably this big. P you know, the mid case, most likely P50. And possible, well, we think there might be some oil over there in this reservoir or we have a reservoir and we're not sure how big it is, it could be this big. So each of these categories, these classes, you gotta kind of keep that in mind. It can mean two different things depending on what system you're using and what the, what the objectives of the reserve report are for. All right, so now we have reserve categories. Let me show you what I mean by that. So you could have producing, non-producing, and non-producing could be uh, shut-in wells that you're going to repair or a uphole recompletion you're going to do or maybe you have a gas reservoir that's producing but you're going to add compression and it's going to increase the reserves that might be considered non-producing. Some people also use the term behind pipe reserves which would just mean other reservoirs in a well bore that you can access later. Sometimes behind pipe and non-producing are combined together. Some people don't have two categories, they just have one. And then of course there's undeveloped reserves. That would be reserves that you have to spend a lot of money like drill a new well or do some major repair or, uh, or a big, big water flood that you're gonna have to spend a lot of money to develop them. So those are the categories. So when we're talking about reserves, we combine the class and category together. So here's some common examples. PDP, that means the proved, developed, producing reserve. So you, it's proved and producing. Then you have proved, developed, non-producing or PDNP or PNP. These, were, these would be wells that are not producing at the time, but you know they're proved, you know it's there or you could have proved behind pipe. Sometimes those are used interchangeably. And then proved undeveloped, PUD. PUD is a common term. It's for drilling, uh, drilling location reserves. All right, so that's the most common uh, ways of describing reserves, proved by the class and category. Now some less common examples, you could have, you could have probable non-producing probable behind pipe or possible undeveloped. So you can describe the reserves in a lot of different ways. These are, the, these are some of the examples. All right, so how do you estimate reserves? That's a, that's a big question. You know, what method, what methodology do you use? It, and so it takes a lot of judgment, but basically you have to see what data you have available that will determine what method you use. So if you have an undrilled prospect, you may just have to, you, you don't really have a lot of data yet because you haven't drilled the well. So you could maybe use analogy or volumetrics to estimate the reserves, maybe even simulation, but that's unusual. But if you have a mature field, you could use decline curve analysis, DCA, that's the most common way of doing reserves in a mature field. But you could also do volumetric estimates or material balance and simulation uh, analysis. The other thing that you have to consider is what's the timing of your project? When do you have to have the answer? If you're trying to estimate reserves on a field that your company wants to buy and they have to put a bid in next month or next week, you don't have time 
to do a reservoir simulation model, you're going to have to use some quicker methods. So the, what's the time you have available? And then what are the objectives of the reserve evaluation? If, if you have an internal reserve report that you're giving to your boss or your manager just because he wants to see, you know, how the drilling program looks, or if it's an external report going to uh, the government agencies or investors, you might do it a little differently. If you're going to be acquiring acquisition of some wells, or maybe you're going to sell your wells, so you're going to do reserve reports. So the objectives may be different in all these cases. So that's how you determine what method to use these three things. All right, so let's look at some of the methods. Oh, okay, let's look at an example. Let's look at an example of a reserve situation that's difficult and it's hard to quantify. And let me show you the questions. Okay, so for instance, if you have a salt dome field, here's a structure map. Uh, showing the salt with, with the radial faults here and the different structural fault blocks here. So we got three fault blocks. All right, and we have a new well that we just drilled. It's a gas well, and it's been producing for two months, so it doesn't have an established decline, so you can't do decline analysis on it. But when we drilled the well, the log showed that the reservoir was 20 feet thick. Then on this fault block, you have a well that had produced for five years, years ago, but then it had watered out, so it's off production. But it, it was 40 feet thick on the, on the well log of this well. All right, so you have a 3D seismic amplitude over this fault block. You have a 3D seismic amplitude over this fault block. And you have a 3D seismic amplitude over this fault block. So anyway, these could be different accumulations, but they all have good seismic indicators of hydrocarbons. Sometimes that's a direct hydrocarbon indicator, the seismic. All right, so here's the question. Now you want to drill a well right here, because it's obvious you need to drill a well right there. But you have two, you have to answer two questions. Does the prospect well have proved, probable, or possible reserves? And it depends on the classification system and the guidelines on how you answer that question and whether or not you're doing this for an internal report or for an external report. So that's one question. What, what do we have in that fault block? Is it proved, probable, or possible? But the second question is, how much gas is in that reservoir? because it could be 20 feet thick or 30 feet or 40 feet thick based on the two other wells, or is it 30 feet thick, take an average. So it's two questions you gotta answer when you're doing a reserve evaluation of this middle fault block. So that's just an example of how that looks. All right, let's go to decline curve analysis. This is the most commonly used method to calculate reserves and it's used on producing wells. All right, here's an example of a producing well production graph. So uh, we have a semi-log plot with gas rate in red on the left with years or time on the bottom scale, the, uh, uh, the x-axis. The, the heavy uh, red line is the production history for the well. So how do we do decline analysis? First thing, you got to review the data. What is this telling you? Uh, is, are there you know, the well's declining. Is it any operational changes right here? Maybe something happened. All right. So is it a, are you going to use a hyperbolic or exponential decline method? Because they're different. So if, if, uh, if the production curve on, the, on a well is curved, if the well is curved, if this line is curved on a semi-log plot, that means it's a hyperbolic decline. But if it's a straight line on a semi-log plot, that would be an exponential. So this is an example of a hyperbolically declining well. So the equations to calculate reserves on your projections are different for each case. So you also have to, you know, look at this data. Is there any, are there any operational changes? You know, did they lower the flowing pressure? On this well, we don't have any flowing pressure data, but you have to can look at all that and consider. So, all right, so we looked at that. Now we want to do a decline projection. It's pretty easy. 
you just go ahead and use your software to fit, you know, a line through the historical data and project into the future of what this well is going to produce. But a few tips, let's have a few tips on how you do that. So you're going to fit the historical data, but you're going to concentrate on the more recent information right here, not this data over here, and especially this little part at the end. So that's just a tip from me. You always, you know, look at the more recent data. And for instance, on, and an example, this is a hyperbolic declining well, and we're using a B factor of 0.65. That's, a lot of people want to know, you know, what B factor you're using. These B factors can range from zero to two, you know, zero to one and a half. So that's an example, a sim pretty simple gas well decline analysis. All right, here's an offshore well decline analysis. And we have more information on here. We have, oh, let me just tell you, always water is blue. Gas, I mean, oil is green and gas is red. So we have the production rates on the y-axis and the time at the bottom. And we went, we went ahead and did a projection of the oil and gas. So we have to do two projections. And we call these PDP reserves because they're producing developed. So that's an easy one, right? And you could do that. All right, let's look at another example. All right, so now we have another example that's producing, but it really doesn't have a lot of history and it's, it doesn't have a decline, you know, a steady trend, you know. So we looked at a lot of data and we did some, we also looked at the volumetric potential, which we'll show how to do that later. Uh, but we have no established decline trend on this yet because it looks like it's just dropping right off the initial flush production. So for this case, I just assumed a 20% decline and uh, that indicated about an ultimate recovery of 1630 on the gas and 59,000 barrels on the oil. But the volumetric potential shows that it could be a million barrels of oil, much higher than this, and three billion cubic feet, which would be two and a, two times higher than my estimate. And uh, so this is a hard one. But I went back and looked at this well, and we have production data now for 2018 and 19, and the well actually went to 300 barrels a day, much higher. So I I, I really got this one wrong but this was a tough one. So I just wanted to show you a little example of some real life uh, samples. All right, the, the next most popular way of calculating reserves are using volumetric calculations. You're just trying to figure out how big the reservoir is. And you have to know whether it's an oil reservoir or a gas reservoir because the calculations and equations are different depending on the fluid type. But to do volumetric calculations, you have to know the area of the reservoir and the thickness of the reservoir. And you have to estimate the porosity and water saturation of the formation that's productive. And you have to know the oil formation volume factor or the gas formation volume factor. And these factors are just takes into account the the shrinkage or expansion of the oil or gas as you bring it out of the reservoir to the surface. And it's based on uh, the pressure and temperature data, PVT data, or you can use uh, correlations to estimate it if you don't have laboratory data, but you have to estimate all these properties. But a real important one you have to estimate is you have to come up with a recovery factor. And that that takes a lot of experience. There's different ways to do it. I'm gonna just show you some a few tips on you know how you might do that, estimate all that. Okay. So the first thing is area. How we're gonna get the area? All right. So we have a in this example we have a well right here with the black star, and we want to calculate the reserves for that well. We have a structure map. This is a subsurface structure map. We got wells all around there. We got data. So we can calculate the area if we know how from this map and we can, that will give us the area for this reservoir. 
But what if you don't have a structure map? Maybe you just have the well and some information on the all the other wells. You don't have a structure map. So what are you gonna what are you gonna do now? So sometimes you got to use your judgment and you say, well, we know these wells watered out and these wells are faulted out. So you kind of look around there and you say, well, maybe the reservoir is that big. So you can just assign an area if that's all you have. So you might say, well, we think this is about 10 acres for that well. So that's just an example. You got to use the data that's available. All right. How do you come up with the the thickness of the reservoir. The best way to do it is to look at the well logs. This is an example of a well log for the Marge H2 reservoir here at, at below the red line. Here's the perforation. So you have to see how thick the well is on the log. That's the best way to get the reservoir thickness. So this is the depth. This is an open hole log. This is like a two inch scale log, but anyway. All right, so you have to calculate, how, you have to estimate the thickness here, and then you have to take out for this little shale break because that's not reservoir rock there, and then you have to add that. So you have to go through each well log and calculate how many feet of pay this is. I wanna show you another example of a well log because you have to estimate this for all the wells in your reservoir. All right, here's a five inch log, which means Five inches on the paper, copy of the log equals 100 feet of depth. This is your depth track. Here's your, this is the SP curve and your resistivity curves. The reservoir that we want to analyze is in between these two blue lines. And it's 27 feet between here. Each one of these divisions is two feet. But there is a little shale break right here. So you have to subtract that out and you're only gonna get net, 25 feet of net sand or net all pay on this well. Now I wanna show you a different log on this well. This is, this is a one inch scale log on this well. The, the five inch log is a detailed log that we use for engineering and detailed calculations. But the one inch log is more, it's a sh uh, smaller scale log that the geologists use to correlate the formations. So the, the reservoir we're evaluating is, in, is pointed to these two blue. So you can see it's much smaller. It'd be hard to calculate how many feet of pay on this. It's not as detailed. But, but you have to use the data that you have available. Sometimes you only have one inch logs if it's a field operated, operated by another company and you don't have the detailed logs available. So you have to estimate the thickness of all the wells in the reservoir Here's a, here's a thick net sand thickness map. Each black dot is a, is a well. Here's our well that we're evaluating right here with the star. But we have to put the thickness of each well as we looked at the log on all these black dots. And then we come in and we do some geologic contouring. A lot of times the geologists will do this and draw these contour shapes. I did this one a few months ago, but I think these red lines are more I think I need to put them, the red line showing like a channel right here. So the depositional environment of the sand will come into play on these maps. But anyway, this kind of map helps you to determine how the thickness of the reservoir changes over the area. So if you, if you don't have a map like this, you would just have to assume a constant thickness to get your reservoir volume. You need area times thickness. But in this case, we have detailed information and we can make a map showing the variation. So we had a structure map. Let's look at the structure map. So we had a structure map showing how big the reservoir is. Now we have a net sand map in this area to show how thick the reservoir is. So we put those two together and we get a uh, net pay isochore map. Isochore map just tows, shows the thickness contours of the reservoir. And because this is an all water contact, that would be zero feet at the all water contact. And then as you move above the oil, above the water, you get into the thickness of the oil. But anyway, you have, to, you have to map this area up and you have to calculate the volumes of each line, like the zero line is this area. The 10, the 10 foot line goes like this. 
So you have to measure the area of each of these lines and you put that in a, a calculation we call uh, right here the spreadsheet uh, table. We put the area of the, um, of the different lines and we have a trapezoid or a pyramidal rule that calculates the, the volume of the reservoir. So in this case, we have, we're gonna calculate the volume of the reservoir because the, the thickness changes. We can't just use a constant thickness. All right, so that would be an example of doing detailed mapping to come up with the area and thickness of your reservoir. So once you know the area and thickness, you're gonna eventually have to estimate recovery factors. And that's, de that's depending on the drive mechanism in your reservoir. Do you have a water drive reservoir, de pressure depletion or gravity segregation or combination of those methods? You have, to you have to have some way to estimate or determine the drive mechanism so you can get the recovery factor. Depending on the oil gravity, that sort of thing will, will affect that. And there's a lot of correlations and calculation methods you can use. I'll just maybe show a little bit on that. But you also have to uh, know the fluid properties and the rock properties because that will affect the recovery factor. But if you, if you don't have a lot of data, you can look at offset fields that have already been depleted or, and you can see what the recovery factor of those reservoirs were, or you can use calculations or correlation, correlations that some of the companies or industry puts out, or you can just use your experience with a similar type of reservoir. So you have to come up with a recovery factor for your volumetric calculation. And there are formulas that you can use. All right. So in general, all recovery could be from anywhere from eight to 55% of the oil in place. So that, that's a good range. All right. Here's an example of a book that I had when I worked at Texaco and it had all the different resources that they gave us the company had you know different correlations to estimate ultimate recovery so you know there's a lot of published data our internal companies have their own methods uh, sometimes they have correlations based on historical data here's an example where if you know the solution gas all ratio and all gravity and the type of rock you can kind of come up with a way to calculate the recovery factor all right, on a gas reservoir, it's completely different. Here's just some guidelines at, from BP that I got at BP. If you have a water influx, water drive reservoir, this could be the recovery factors of the gas. Anyway, so there's a bunch of ways to do it, but you gotta come up with a recovery factor if you're doing volumetric calculations. Okay, you can use, there's some equations you know, for uh, depletion drive reservoir, water drive reservoir, partial water drive. So you have to know all this information to calculate, but there are equations you can use to get a recovery factor. And, and typically a gas reservoir, the recovery factor would range from 50 to 90% of the gas in place. So that's kind of a good rule of thumb. All right, so let's just show an example of oil volumetrics. All right, so we compiled all our reservoir properties. The ones that are gonna go into the equation are here with the boxes. B sub O I stands for oil formation volume factor. It's reservoir barrels divided by stock tank barrels. So um, first step would be to calculate the unit oil in place. That's the, that's the oil in place per unit of volume. And you just use the standard uh, U.S. oil fuel units. You have to use 7758 times the porosity times 1 minus the water saturation, which SW is water saturation, divided by the oil formation volume factor. So in this case, the unit oil in place is 1,422 barrels oil per acre foot. That's how much is in the reservoir. But now we have to know the volume and that's area times thickness, which we have to get the acres and the foot, foot of pay. And so we're trying to calculate the original all in place, which is area 
times thickness times the unit all in place. And if you want MBOs, which is thousands of barrels, you got to divide by thousands. So in this case, the original oil in place is 448,000 barrels of oil. And then now we have to start estimating the recovery factor based on what kind of drive mechanism, what kind of fluids we have, you know. And so we, we've gone through that and we determined 33% recovery factor for this reservoir. So reserves for the reservoir are just the all in place times the recovery factor, original all in place. And in this case, it's 147,000 barrels of oil. So that would be an example of going through the equations and filling in the data for oil volumetrics. Gas volumetrics is similar, but there's different constants and uh, data you, that you need, but mostly it's the same data. All right, here's another example of doing oil volumetrics. Here's the structure map. This is an offshore field. We have a producing well right here. We have a gas cap with an oil rim. So we have a complicated reservoir that has oil and gas in it. It's about 354 acres. So we have a detailed geologic map. We go ahead and make the, uh, for the gas cap, we have to do the uh, isochore thickness map of the gas. So at the gas oil contact, it will be zero feet thick. And then at the well, it's all gas at the top. So, or mostly all gas. So these are the thicknesses of the gas part of the reservoir. And so we can perimeter these areas to get the volume. And we use, we use the little uh, spreadsheet with the trapezoid or period methods to get the total volume of the reservoir, 1648. And then we can go ahead using the fluid properties, we can calculate the original gas in place of 3589. So anyway, this is just a little example. Sometimes you have to make a detailed map. So what about the oil reserves for this reservoir? So we have to make a, a net oil pay for that reservoir. Here, here's, here's the zero line right here should be the all water contact. And then the thickness, five feet thick, 10 feet thick. So here's your map. This is called an isocore map. Some people call it isopack. And you can get the area and volume by, you have to calculate the area of these volumes, these uh, lines. Again, you put all your data your acres that you calculate into the formula and it calculates the volume of 3544. So it's just a little mathematical formula. It's in your textbook, the trapezoid and pyramid rule. The average pay over the whole reservoir is 10 feet. That's just that, this number divided by that number just to get an average, but all right. So in this case, we have a water drive reservoir. We I have a little spreadsheet that I've developed where you put in different properties of the fluids and the rock and, and it calculates a recovery factor of 0.41. So from the all in place, the all in place is 7506 MBO or 5.7 uh, 5 million barrels of oil. The solution gas in place is here. So there will be some solution gas in there. And so the, the recovery factor of 0.41 times the all in place gets you the reserves of 2375. Anyway, so this is just a detailed example of the steps you got to go through and the data you got to compile. But it takes a lot of judgment to know what, what data to put in all these equations, you know, because they have some variability. So that's an example of an oil rim volumetric calculation. And, all right, what about analogy? What does that mean? Analogy method. Well, sometimes if you don't have a lot of information, you just have to use an analogy. And that basically, that's basically just saying, well, we don't know what we have, but we know the other company has a big field and it could, you know, so we might use some information from an offsetting field. So for example, you have a nearby field that produced 10 million barrels from the same reservoir as our prospect so we're gonna drill a prospect. So we're gonna estimate that it has 10 million barrels because we think it's similar and based on analogy. So that's pretty simple, right? Another example would be 
we have limited data on our new producing well, you know, we don't have a decline yet, so we can't do decline analysis. But we know there's four wells right around there that produce five BCF per well. So with no other information, we're gonna just go ahead and book five BCF for our new well. So that would just be the analogy. And that's done a lot. That's done a lot of the time if, you know, it's common to do this. All right, so say you have another example, say you have an offsetting fuel, a nearby fuel that has oil with a gas cap and the gas cap is covering 50% of the reservoir. And you just drilled a new well in your oil reservoir, but and it, it penetrated the oil uh, rim of the reservoir and, and has similar oil properties but we know it probably has a gas cap, but we don't know how big the gas cap is. So just by analogy, we're gonna just assume that our gas cap is 50% like the other field. So that'll be three examples of analogy. But the big, big analogy method is type curves. This is, this is the new thing for the shale evaluations. Uh, so, we call them type curves or type wells or drilling type curves. There's different names for them, but they're real popular now with the shale evaluations. Because in the shale evaluations, you plant, it's really statistical, the results of the wells. So you have to come up with a way to estimate reserves. And we use the type curves to evaluate the future drilling, reserves for the future drilling wells. And it's pretty simple. You just use the existing wells production that are in the area and you just create an average rate profile for the future wells. So you just take all the production histories from their surrounding wells and you average them up. And that helps you determine how much reserves your well when you drill it, how much reserves it'll have. So this is real popular now. And you also have to like adjust the type curves for lateral length and stuff like that if you know it. All right, so. I wanted to tell you, I have a YouTube video showing how to make type curves using PhD Win software. So that's a common software that I use, but it just shows you the steps and an example of one. So you might want to watch that. Just search Mirror and Associates uh, YouTube. And I have a lot of videos on different things. You can check that out. It might be helpful. All right, what about material balance? Uh, Material balance is just uh, saying that the material that comes out of a reservoir is equal to what was there plus what you put into the reservoir or, or influxed into the reservoir minus what is left. So it's just a mass balance uh, principle. So it's, it's a diagnose, diagnostic procedure to analyze the reservoir characteristics. It can tell you, uh, and we have material balance equations in for both oil and gas reservoirs. And we have software that does the calculations. You can do them by hand, but most people use some software. And they're simple equations, but it describes the change in reservoir pressure as you withdraw oil and water or gas or inject all the uh, water or gas into the reservoir. But you have to have the oil and gas fluid properties, rock compressibility, average reservoir pressure, and cumulative production data over time to input into the models. But it will help you determine the original oil in place or the original gas in place in your reservoir and whether or not it has a water, in, water flood or a water influx from an aquifer. So it will give you the size of the reservoir and help you determine what the drive mechanism. But you have to have some production history and you have to have pressure data reservoir pressure data to do material balance. That's all I'm gonna say about material balance. There's all kind of, oh no, I'm gonna say one other thing. There's all kind of ways to do it, but I'm gonna show you like a simple one that a lot of people use. We call it a P over Z plot. And these are for gas reservoirs. And so what we have is basically pressure divided by Z factor. Z factor is just accounts for the, uh, uh, the variation of the gas compared to a, a real a normal gas. Uh, the hydrocarbon gas to uh, perfect gas. So anyway, it's basically pressure versus the cumulative gas production here. So these green dots would be pressure data at different points in time. Uh, and this method is very common. 
and depletion drive gas reservoir to use. But we, you have to have good reservoir or bottom hole pressure data to do it. So in this instrument, instance, we had to estimate the bottom hole pressure from shut in tubing pressures. We didn't have measured pressure. So these two points probably weren't shut in long enough. And the pressure had not built up. So we're going to not use those. You have to use your judgment. So you can fit a curve through this, the, the straight line through these points. And it will tell you what the original gas in place for the reservoir is. So in this case, it's 17.8 BCF. So it tells you the size of the reservoir, but you have to have some production history, cumulative and, and pressure data. So the cumulative production to, as of today is right here at this point. And then you have to estimate the abandonment pressure. So you can't, you can't deplete the reservoir down to zero pressure, but you have to estimate the abandonment pressure and there's different ways to do that. But wherever the abandonment pressure P over Z reaches that line, that would be the ultimate recovery from that reservoir, about 15 and a half BCF. So remaining reserves would be the difference between this line and this line. So that's just a simple sample of P over Z plot. This one I did correct the P over Z for formation compressibility that sometimes is important. So just keep that in mind. Anyway, so that's a, that's a common example of a PO, uh, material balance P over Z plot for a gas reservoir. All right, what about reservoir simulation? That's, a, that's another way we can estimate reserves. This is a little simulation block that on a project we just finished about three weeks ago. It's a big, deep, high pressure gas reservoir with one well right here. Here's the reservoir in blue. These are non-reservoir parts in red. But anyway, so this is an actual project we just finished for a deep gas reservoir in Louisiana. But reservoir simulations can confirm your geologic model and the size of the reservoir. And you can also simulate various development options. Like if we drill more wells in here, how much reserves will we get? So we can get the ultimate recovery and reserves for the reservoir. So let's say, how do you do it? How do you do it? And I'm just gonna give you some basic detail. It's not real detailed. So you have to build a 3D reservoir model using the geology or some information about the size and shape of the reservoir and you have to, and you have to divide it into grid blocks. For instance, these are the grid blocks right here, all these little squares. But then you have to populate the grid blocks with all the reservoir data, fluid data, pressure, and where the wells penetrate the fault blocks. So you, have to, you have to have a lot of information to populate the grid blocks for the simulator. So the way you, the way you start is if you, if you have a producing reservoir, you specified some historical data into the simulation model and you let it simulate the other data. For example, we could specify the actual historical oil production from the reservoir over time and let the simulator predict what the gas, water, and reservoir pressure would be over that historical oil production. Then we compare the simulated data of these properties to the actual. So if, if they don't match, we have to adjust as necessary to get it to match. I'll show you an example, but that's called a history match. So that's the first thing is you match the history of the reservoir with the simulator. And then you can predict out into the future what's gonna happen once you have your model working good and that would give you the reserve. So that's one way of getting reserves is a simulation model. All right, here's an example of the well we just finished working on. It has reservoir pressure versus time. And the actual data that we had on the reservoir are in the red dots and the simulation is in black. So we were able to adjust the model to get a pretty good simulation match. And when we did that match, it told us how big the reservoir had to be to get this amount of data. So this gave us the size of the reservoir. That's what we were trying to confirm with the study. Another thing we did match is we had flow and bottom hole pressure data versus time. And so we had some data points from tests 
and we we let the uh, simulator uh, using some well more hydraulics calculate the flow and bottle pressure and tried to get that to match. So we had a pretty good match. I mean, that's an example of a simulation study on a gas reservoir. But it takes a lot of time to build it, history match, and then to simulate the future production. So you got to have a lot of time. Sometimes it takes longer than the other methods, depending on how detailed. And it can give you a non-unique solution. You could, you could build two different reservoir models that match the production history. So you, you got to be careful because you might have the wrong model built. So anyway, this non-unique. But you can run multiple realizations, you know, or different reservoir sizes or shapes, and you can get qualitative data on the reservoir. Uh, for instance, you might run two different size reservoirs that match the history but it would kind of bracket like it could be this it could be this small but it could be this big so maybe the answer is somewhere in between or you can say well we don't know everything about the reservoir but we did some water flooding uh, simulation and it shows a water flood probably won't be good in this type of reservoir so you can get some qualitative information also not just you know uh, the exact reserve projections all right I want to emphasize when you calculate the reserves, part one is to calculate reserves. Part two is to estimate the value. So how do we estimate the value? Well, a simple way, okay, so we just don't want volumes, we want dollars. So a simple way is to do in a market analysis. I don't know if anybody's heard of a market analysis, but uh, what you do is you just, you, you have a field that you want to do reserves on and you look at fields in the nearby area that have been sold or bought. And how much did they, how, how much did they pay for the fields in the area? So here's an example of a bunch of uh, transactions with the amount of money they paid for them. It describes it, but it also tells you if you, when they report the reserves for these fields, you can say, well, we paid $3 per barrel and you can get an average. Or if you know how much these fields were producing at the time of the sale, you can say, well, we paid 34,000 per, per, per flowing barrel. So you can, get, you can get some averages if you have enough data. Or if you just, all you know is that it was a thousand acres and they paid $20,000 per acre. So you can get some general information and so if you know the proved reserves of your field you can multiply it times the average sale price and now you know the value of your field or if you know your field is producing a thousand barrels a day and the people in the area sold their wells for twenty thousand dollars per flowing barrel now you can figure out what your field might be worth or you can just do it based on how many acres your reservoir or field covers. So, or you can do a, or you can do a combination of all those and kind of compare, you know, what the market is telling you the value of your reserves are. And this is done a lot for shale acreage, this type of thing. All right, but that's pretty simple. It's not that technical, but the, uh, here's an example. Here's some more examples of published uh, transactions where companies were buying and selling properties. So that's how you do a market analysis. But the most common and complicated way is to use a discounted cash flow e analysis, or we call it economics, economic analysis. But to do this, you have to estimate a lot of things. You have to know the future production from your wells. You need to know how much capital money you're going to spend to drill them. You have to know the production taxes, the operating expenses. You got to you got to estimate what the oil and gas prices are going to be in the future and what the price differentials are. So there's a lot of stuff you have to estimate and project. And you have to do it for each producing well. You have to do a decline projection on each well. You have to make a rate profile for each recompletion or drilling location. 
with the timing and the cost and the operating expense, you have to do a lot of projections. But you have to pick a discount rate. Discounting is where you just take into the, the time value of money, like an interest rate. So in most US reserve uh, evaluations, we use a 10% discount rate. And the SEC specifies this for public companies. You have to use 10% discount rate. All right, one of the things you have to project is you have to estimate what are the operating expenses are gonna be for your wells to help value them. And I'm gonna go fast through this, but operating expenses are important because it affects the cash flow and the reserve value and your discounted cash flow. And it, you have to know the operating experience, expense to know the economic limit of each well because once the well declines and reaches the economic limit, there are no reserves after that point. An operating expense is just normal ongoing cost to operate a well or a field. You know, it's the people, supplies, maintenance, that kind of stuff. You know, if there's normal ongoing repairs of the pumps or tubing, you know, that would be included. But it, operating expense does not include capital expenses expenditures like drilling or recompleting of new reservoirs or wells. That's not part of operating expense. And generally we do not include production or ad valorem taxes as operating expense. We include them as a deduct later on. Most software, we, that's how we do it. But that's just some general information. And when you're gonna estimate the expenses, you know, in the future, you can either assume a fixed amount of expenses where it doesn't change over time or you could have a variable expense where um, as the production declines, you know, the expenses will go down. So these are two different ways of looking at expenses. And, you know, how do you determine what your operating expenses are going to be for your reserve report? Well, you best way is to look at historical information and see what they were spending last year. And that might tell you what they're going to expend on operating expense this year. If you don't have historical data, you could use published data from similar fields, or if you have experience in the area, you know, working wells that are that deep and similar type wells, you may have to use estimated data, but you have to estimate operating expenses to do your cash flow. And it's like I said, there's two ways to do it. You can expend, you can model all your expenses as fixed where it doesn't change. And that, that will give you lower reserves and value or you can model all expenses as variable, but then that gives you higher reserves and value. So it's real important how you do it, what method you choose, and I'm gonna show you a little example. All right, so we wanna estimate operating expense. Usually on our software, we put it in as dollars per month or per well. All right, so here's, let's look at an example. Here's two wells that we're gonna calculate the reserves on, well one and well two, and there's all the expenses each month that the operator has provided to us. And it shows all the categories of expense and the total each month. So you have to look at all this and see, you know, is it constant? Is it jumping all around? But the easy thing, you know, easy first step is just take the average and say, okay, this well, it costs $4,419 per month to operate that well. So you could use that in your reserve projection for well number one. And we do that, this kind of method a lot. Well, two appears to be having more expenses. It's about $8,600 per month. So for well two, you would use a different operating expense. Okay, and this is done all the time. So what happens if you're gonna drill a new well, what expense would you use for, the oper for that new well? Well, you might just take the average between those two for the new drill well. All right, so that's, that's an example. Let's look at a different example where you have field level expenses. We don't have the rep, we don't have expenses by well, we just have expenses by field, but we know there, there were five producing wells last year in the field. So you got all the different categories of expenses and the amount of dollars you spend each month. You have to look at all this, see if it's constant, is it jumping all around or the large one-time expenses? You know, you gotta take that into consideration. You know, like contract labor, that seems to be a pretty constant one. 
maybe a compressor compressor expense looks pretty high. Anyway, so you can average these up and it looks like this field, it takes $52,000 a month to operate the field. So that might be what we're gonna use, you know, for our reserve projection, but we, we might just, divide it up by the five wells and apply 10,000 a month per well into our economic software. All right, but that would be considered a fixed way of doing it. Now we also have all production here in green. So this is how much all they produced each year and the average per month, each month of the year. So if you, you know the expenses and you know how many barrels, you can also calculate that it was $13.50 per barrel to operate this field. So that would be a way of doing, that's a variable. So which one are we gonna use? Are we gonna use the, the, the 52,000 or the 13? Well, we might do a combination method because we don't wanna be optimistic or pessimistic. So using a combination method might be right in this case. So what we're gonna to have to do is we're gonna, using our experience, we're gonna to have to estimate what part of these expenses are fixed and variable. And you have to put factors for every one. For instance, this compressor charge, we're saying it's 50% fixed and 50% variable. That means as the fuel declines, you're not gonna need as much compression. So that expense should go down, but you're never gonna get, you're always gonna have at least one or two compressors in the field. So it can't, it's not 100% variable. So you estimate all these and then you can calculate this columns in the right to estimate the fixed and variable amount. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna use a uh, fixed of 28,000 and you divide that by five wells and it gives you 5678 fixed per month and then the 24,000 variable divided by the average production in a month and that gives you $6.21 per barrel. So we kind of use the hybrid method on this. So we're gonna model it with two parts in our economic software. So anyway, that's just an example. Uh, uh, you know, it does make a difference in the reserves and value how you model the operating expense. You also have to, as you have to determine the price differentials and that's just, that's just the difference in the price you receive for your oil and gas versus what the market price was at that time. Uh, and the difference is gonna be positive or negative uh, so say, say your crude oil quality has a lot of sulfur in it, so you don't get paid the full oil price, or there's some transportation charges that have to be taken off the price. So anyway, that's how you, that's why you can have, uh, prices in your economics that are not, you know, equal to what the market price is. So you have to understand that. And it's important because it affects the revenue from and the economic limits and your reserve value. And you have to have them to do your future cash flows. And the best way to determine them is, you know, you look at the historical data and see, you know, this field last year, they were getting $10 over the West Texas Intermediate because they have a premium oil or something like that. So you have to, go back in history and compare and figure out what those differences are and apply them. But if you don't have any historical data, you might, you might have to talk to the operator, you know, he may have a contract, you know, or something. So you have to estimate the price differentials to do a discounted cash flow reserve evaluation. Or you may have to just look at published reports or industry data of the fields in a certain area. and uh, use that, but you have to estimate something. All right, so what's a discounted cash flow analysis? What does it look like? Typically use a 10% discount rate. That's SEC guidelines. So we can run the cash flow reports using our software by the well, by the category, class, et cetera. All different ways we can run the reports. These, or we can wanna run a one-line summary report. And I'm gonna show you a couple examples and what a report looks like. All right, here's a reserve cash flow report for the big oil company, and this is for the total company. So this is all their reserves. You have the years right here. Here's your oil and gas projected volumes. That's from your decline analysis or whatever you're doing. 
and you have your net oil and gas, that would be your ownership share. If you have to pay royalties or you have a partner in the well, you don't own 100%, you have to show the, you have to only value the net amount of reserves that the client owns or your company owns. Here are the prices that I forecasted. So I just used the constant price of about $25 a barrel, but this fuel has a $2 deduct. So the differential price differential affects the price. And then you get the revenue, the operating costs or operating expense are here, your production taxes and your investments to drill wells. And then you get a non-discounted cash flow. That's just the cash flow revenue minus expenses minus investments, and you get an undiscounted and a total. And these are all in thousands, thousands of dollars and thousands of barrels or millions of cubic feet. So here's a sample of the total company. And of always, you have to tell the client what the discount rate and the as of date. Remember, that's very important to have as of date and a discount rate. All right. So this report says that big oil company is worth $2.2 million. All their reserves are worth $2.2 million because that's the total of the discounted cash flow. That's how we value it. And we can have some indicate economic indicators. This is some software that I use. Each software is different, but usually you can get some in economic indicator rate of return. On, okay. And then you also have different discount rates shown down here and what the value of the company would be at different discount rates. As you use a higher discount rate, the value of the, the reserves go down. All right, let's look at another example. This would be a, a summary of all the proved undeveloped reserves for your field. Uh, and so this one shows uh, the investment of that and this, you know, same parameters. So this would be, could be a summary of a bunch of wells that you're gonna drill. Then, then let's look at an individual producing well. Here's, the, here's a sample of the producing well, and it only lasts you know, until 2028. But on the individual wells, the reports kind of show some of the decline parameters and all there. And it also shows the ownership of that well because each well could have a different ownership. And so this well is worth $301,000 based on a discounted cash flow analysis. All right, let's look up like a well you're gonna drill, a proposed well. Okay, so we have proved undeveloped, we have the investments, we have the projected decline rates and how the oil is gonna decline over time. We have the ownership of this well. It's, you know, it's a little different than the producing well. And this project to drill a well has a value of $269,000. You have the investments in there. It's in the first year. And then you can look at the value of that well at different discount rates because sometimes if, you, if you're valuing drilling wells, you might want to use a higher discount rate because it has some uncertainty and risk. So like a PV15 is only worth $194,000 versus the $270,000. So that's an example of cash flow reports either by total or by individual well. But another report that we always like to see, we call it a one-liner report. So it shows the reserves and revenue, and, but it shows one line for each well. And you can have like the reserve categories totaled up at the top, but it shows what each well, what the reserves and value is all on one page. So you can see, you know, multiple wells on one page. Like these are producing, proved, developed producing. So that's a one line report. That's real handy. All right. Kind of went real fast through a lot of it. I uh, hope you just got the feel for some of the techniques and data you need and how it works. But I do have a four part YouTube series that goes through all this stuff in a little more detail. And it, but it's using, it's how you use PhD wind software, which that's a common software, but the principles are all good. So anyway, I hope that was informative and I know I went real fast, but I hope you learned a little bit as you go out into the oil industry 
and you start doing reserves. They're very important and need, they need good people to do the reserve estimates. And that's all I have. Thank you very much for the great presentation. Uh, I got many, many questions for you. I will take uh, my five questions. So um, the first question, someone asking about uh, how can we estimate the reserve of uh, tight gas and shell gas uh, using uh, uh, the plan curve analysis? Anything special about that? Well, uh, when you get into the real tight stuff, they have some more analytical methods. You know, they have some rate transit analysis stuff and software. Uh, you know, for producing wells, it gets pretty complicated. I, uh, I'm not an expert at that, but, you know, I have people that work with me and we do it. But you have to use some more sophisticated techniques using software to help. You, you know, you can do basic decline curve analysis and get a pretty good answer. But sometime, if it's early in the life of the well, you might have to do a little bit more analytical methods. Uh, but, but for drilling wells, we use type curves all the time to estimate what an average well will make when you drill it. Okay. Um, I believe the second question may be related to what you just said. Someone asking, can the clan curve analysis done on six months uh, producing wells? Uh, well, I need to see that if it's a, if it's a uh, exponential decline, you know, it has a trend, you could use it. If it's a hyperbolic shale well, it's harder because you, you don't have the shape established. But what you can do is you can make type curves of all the other wells in the area and get the shape of the curve and then apply that to your well that only has six months of data. And I have a video on that showing how to do that. Uh, it's called a, a tip for using type curves on producing wells, but you can do it. And like I said, if you have sophisticated software, analytical software, you can do all that. But I don't have all that, and I don't generally do it. I use simple, pretty simple stuff. Okay. Uh, a second, uh, a third question. Someone asking about uh, how to use material balance in uh, multi-layer reservoirs and uh, heterogeneous ones. Yeah, that that doesn't work because most of the software assumes a tank, uh, you know, a constant uh, property tank. Uh, now, some of the, some of the, um, like, uh, MBAL, the uh, Prosper MBAL and GAP MBAL program, you can have different tanks that are connected to each other. So you could maybe, like, approximate different uh, layers using that. But it's not, it's really designed to have a, a homogeneous tank. Okay. Um... Also, another question, someone asking about the best alternative if we, if we don't have uh, seismic data. You know, uh, when to decide the right place to drill a well, for example. Oh, well, that's, that's kind of beyond the scope of this presentation, but, uh, you know, that, that's more into exploration and stuff. Uh, also, he, he asked about the, how to calculate the risk of uh, drilling a new well. Oh. Okay, look, I just did a video on that. <laughs> I got a lot of videos and it shows how to risk a prospect and that's on YouTube. Okay, perfect. And I would recommend you go to there. I mean, I could show you if you want, I could pull it up but, and show you what it looks like. But, uh, and I put it on LinkedIn. I just Wait. did it about a week ago. It shows how you risk them and it has a if well. You, it's if, you, uh, if you send me these links and uh, LinkedIn, I can share, share it with all the audience. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, um, the last question, what kind of software you are using in uh, reservoir simulation? Also, uh, do we do, do that software use artificial intelligence? No, I don't have it. Uh, I used on this deep gas reservoir, we use Reveal, which is a PEDEX pro project, uh, PEDEX uh, block all simulator. Uh, PEDEX is a company that has MBAL, GAP, uh, and Reveal. And, uh, but, you know, reservoir simulation is not a big part of my business. But like I said, we just did one and we used uh, the Reveal program for the gas, deep gas well. Okay, so the last thing today, are you willing to share the PDF of your presentation with the audience? 
Sure. Okay. So, uh, Kurt, thank you very much for the great presentation. It was really very informative. And uh, thank you, everybody, for watching uh, this webinar. And uh, please wait for uh, Dr. Mehdi Azari in the second webinar today after, um, you know, uh, around an hour and a half. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Okay. All right. I hope everybody learned a little bit.